two, one, and pop! We are live. Welcome, folks. Uh, it is a question and answer episode 30. I'm joined uh, by Seraph Interrupted and Mr. Mello from the CSJ Discord uh, community. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, joining me this evening. Um, I will state that uh, it's been kind of interesting because, like, everyone's asking, like, hey, where's, where's CS Joseph been? Like, what's been going on, you know? Uh, and, uh, well, honestly, uh, my day job, uh, as well as uh, just a whole bunch of other things going on in my life, uh, I had to get uh, my health back on track, uh, create a very nice new food management system, uh, and spending a, a lot of time uh, with my girlfriend, uh, Railgun, and, uh, you know, she's been absolutely fantastic. In fact, uh, she uh, made me a rosemary uh, chicken and rice for dinner tonight. It was exquisite, um, and she's a fantastic woman. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, that's just kind of where I've been. Uh, also, we're in a new studio right now, and you can kind of tell that like i'm in a new studio because like there's like additional like paintings and stuff over there and whatnot so so yeah i do apologize for like not being around uh but uh and being on time for that matter but uh it's just it's summertime uh i do have a day job i'm not going anywhere and now that i've moved into the studio i'm in a much better position to be able to uh, produce content and uh, we're going to be going in that direction as well so I'm really excited about all that. Uh, so you know, let's uh, let's uh, get down to it. So uh, tonight, remember, guys, the format is usually you know we start off with the Patreon questions, and then we get to uh, Discord questions unless a super chat comes in, and then we stop what we're doing, and then we answer the super chat, and then we keep going uh, from there. And uh, but yeah, just a Q and A with CSJ and uh, episode thirty tonight, folks. Uh, welcome and. Uh, Let's get this show on the road. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Mello, uh, what's our what's our first question for uh, this evening? All right. So, from Ren Maven, it says, "Who are some examples of INFJ women who have actually done something with their lives, and what did they do?" And then it says, in parentheses, "In history or the present, other than the standard Joan of Arc example." Uh, I'm not sure I would actually use Joan of Arc, uh, you know, in, as an INFJ example. I'm not really sure I would do that, but uh, well, let me think. Famous INFJs who've done something. I mean, we've tied plenty of INFJs. I mean, just look at J.K. Rowling, right? She's a successful INFJ who is the author of the Harry Potter series. Um, and uh, I, I, I am actually one of those people that likes the new movies. Uh, some people don't like the new movies. I actually like them, and she actually like wrote them. And uh, she chose Johnny Depp and ENTP to play Gellert Grindelwald, who is an ENTP. So I think that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, it's uh, just stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, stuff like that. One second, going to toss a text there. Uh, um, once you know, Chase, I would like to see more women be typed on our uh, <laughs> typing streams. Yeah, tell um, me about it. Yeah, so um, if, if, if our audience can be thinking of some women that they like to be typed, maybe we'll, we'll run into some. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. I got to send this text. And there we go. All right, cool. Uh, so, um, the, yeah, I mean, J.K. Rowling. What were, Jay, what were some other people that we had typed as INFJ as well oh. that we've done? Uh, PewDiePie was one. That's true. But there are very few, very few women. I mean, I think she was the only one, woman. There might have been. Oh, we had like a we had like a, a pop star or a rock star. Uh, we did like that it's... Australian. Who was that Australian INFJ woman that we did? Uh -oh. Gosh. Uh -oh. Oh, you know, I can't remember. Uh, we need a list. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? We've done so many. We've done so many. No, we're, uh, we, we are releasing a list, though. The list is coming out very soon. Yeah, so. Very cool. Yeah. Great. So, uh, Dua Lipa. There we go. Thank you, Web Wizard. Thank you. <laughs> and yes, PewDiePie is an INFJ. Yes. <laughs> I was surprised by that one, and that's why I remembered it, frankly. Yeah, Kyla. Oh, Marina and the Diamonds is an INFJ. And Kylie Minogue. That's right. Thank you. 
Oak. That's the one. Cool. All right, next question. Cool. So the next platinum question comes from Aiden, and he says, "What are three things you have learned from the audience about typology?" Three things from the audience that I have learned. Wow. Oh, let's see here. Trusty little whiteboard. Um, three things I have learned about the audience about typology. I have definitely learned uh, the the meaning of TE child or uh, TE in general. Because in the absence of explanation or communication, perceptions become reality, and just how easy it is. Um, so I, I can hear myself through somebody's uh, volume. They're not sure. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, like it's. Um, I've learned mostly about like TE, and then also like uh, how ENFPs can utilize TE child. Um, I've also learned that. Um, one thing, I guess it didn't really surprise me, but I just wasn't expecting it to happen, is like all of the INFPs uh, being triggered by the INFJ lecture uh, was probably the biggest one. So that when I did the uh, how do INFJs and INFPs uh, compare to one another, uh, I made sure that was like an hour and a half long just to really like drive the point home because I was apparently triggering all the INFPs out there who thought they were INFJs because we have people like Frank James out there who is an INFP claiming that he's an INFJ and he's literally confusing people all the time on his channel on, on a consistent basis. And uh, no offense to Mr. James, I mean, I was there too. I for years thought I was an INTJ and I was like treating people differently and expecting people to treat me certain ways. And when you come to the realization that your type is not actually the type that you think you are, it can really, it can be really devastating. And I had a really hard time as a result of that. So it could be, um, it could be definitely uh, something uh, very uh, difficult. And yes, Florence uh, from Florence the Machine is an INFJ as well. Thank you for that one. Thank you for that one as well. And I think the third thing that I learned uh, about typology from the audience, I would say, is basically uh, it's something that's coming up in season 17, and it's all about child, uh, child development, like actual children developing cognition and whatnot, and the competing theories as a result. We talk about quadra shifting, but we also talk about um, uh, the aspirational child, uh, which is the other theory as well. And I honestly, I'm learning, I'm leaning towards the aspirational child, it's the theory of cognitive development in children. But uh, we're, I'm going to be talking about that in depth um, uh, uh, in uh, the rest of season 17. Uh, so, but yeah, that's how I would uh, answer that question. What's next? All right. So that's it for the first round of Platinum. Awesome. So in the Patreon channel, Lucio says, which types are the most diligent or hardworking? with work, projects, and just daily tasks in general. Ooh, which types are the most diligent um, and hardworking? That is super subjective. Uh, it's really hard to rate them. I've seen ISFJs be like insanely hardworking, like insanely hardworking uh, people. So uh, definitely I'd put ISFJs up there. I've also seen ENTJs be insanely hardworking. I've seen, like it could, it's lit, like work ethic, honestly, Work ethic, it could be any type. It really can be any type. Um, however, like types that are more prone to lacking work ethic, definitely STJ and FP Quadra out of all of them, which is the types that are the, uh, they have the highest chance of being selfish or um, uh, lazy uh, because SI laziness combined with FI selfishness, it just, it can really get in the way. And if they're not in the mood to work or be productive, they're not going to be productive, basically. They're also the types out of all the types that complain the most. They have the highest uh, complaining. Um, they complain more than any other type, which can be an issue uh, for them, as well as like stunting their personal growth, etc. cetera. But uh, it's, it, it can be, it can be an issue. Um, but Largely, though, work ethic is very subjective. I mean, I know uh, I know an INFP preacher in the Midwest, for example, who's also a day trader, and he's insanely diligent in everything that he does. Now, in terms of the one type that I've noticed to be the most diligent of all of the types, uh, it's by far the ISFP. Like, absolutely hands down, the ISFP takes the cake. The reason why, they just... 
I don't know, like my former father-in-law, he just, he would not stop. He just would not stop. Uh, the only time he would stop is basically sundown. But if there was daylight, he's like, I am making use of this daylight, and he goes all the way for it. And that's literally what it was. You know, daylight is everything to him. Uh, so I would say uh, ISFP would probably be the most hardworking out of all of them. However, they have to be in the mood for it, and they have to actually want to do it, and they have to be, you know, motivated to make it happen, which doesn't always happen. And then because they take, they, they extract joy from their work, from their art that they do. And if they don't have that joy, well, it's just not just going anywhere, so... All right. So next question comes from Jenner. It says, right. I, I know a confirmed ENFJ and ISTJ. I have seen their interactions, and I do not understand how they can have a deep relationship, or maybe I don't understand what you mean by deep relationship. What would an ENFJ and ISTJ friendship look like, and where would the depth come from? Really don't understand why they don't seem to mesh well. Could it be nurture or ISTJ has issues? Okay, so is she saying they do have a deep relationship or they do not? I think she's meaning in general right. how, how these two types could have a deep relationship and, and what a friendship between the two would look like and where any depth would come from between the two. Right, right. Okay, so here's what the uh, ENFJ uh, ISTJ relationship actually looks like. Um, so both of them are affiliated. They're focused on doing the right thing, right? And you have the hero function right here, trying to uh, basically get with the uh, the child function, and the uh, child function trying to reach to the hero function with the ISTJ, and then obviously the inferior functions to the parent functions. The problem is. Parent functions can be so harsh that the ISTJ TE parent is looking down on the ENFJ and basically is like, well, I feel the ENFJ is stupid, which brings out, guess what? It brings out the TE demon of the ENFJ. And it, it, that's basically where it goes. Not only that, the ISTJ is also scared, um, consistently scared, uh, because it's like, well, wait a minute, you're a very willful person and I parent but I'm afraid of your will, so I'm just gonna be afraid of you. So at the same time, they're afraid of the ENFJ, while also they're looking down at the ENFJ and looking at them as stupid. So you have literally fear plus you're stupid, and they have this attitude. It's very easy for ISTJs to have this attitude about ENFJs. Now granted, eventually over time, the ISTJ will understand that the ENFJ is very caring and whatnot, but the ISTJ will always look down upon the ENFJ and be like, you're stupid, basically. Uh, which, you know, and especially when you add in like, you know, a, a male uh, versus, uh, you know, female, a male ISTJ versus a female uh, ENFJ, it can get even, it can get even more difficult because, you know, SJs, they have, because they have SE nemesis and SE critic, they can have this air of elitism about them. And that can be applied directly to the ENFJ. And like the, the ISTJs walk around, it's like, you know, oh, you're worried that you're not a good enough person. That's right, because you actually aren't a good person. You know, they're like, yeah, you're not worthy of me, you know. And that FI child can start having that attitude of you're not worthy of me, etc., cetera, which, uh, which can be a thing. Now, unbeknownst to the ISTJ, the ENFJ is not stupid because TI aspirational makes them, you know, potentially the most brilliant of all the types. Remember, any inferior function that is aspirational can beat any hero function. Absolutely, it could beat any hero function. So when the subconscious is fully developed, that subconscious can absolutely dominate. So in order for them to have a good relationship, here's what I recommend. The ENFJ has to be consistently giving to the ISTJ in order for SE child to try to attempt to develop loyalty out of the SI hero, while at the same time avoiding criticizing the ISTJ as much as possible because the TE parent does, just does not care what um, what TI inferior thinks. It just does not care. Uh, the other thing is, is that... Um, on top of that, like, you know, any inferior, uh, the ENFJ needs to do this thing where they're like, well, ask permission, 
like seriously, ask permission with what they want to do, or at least tell the ISTJ what they want to do before they do it. And in doing so, it makes the ISTJ less afraid, right? So that's what I would recommend on how to uh, fix this issue. Um, cool. Next question. Yeah. All right. Comes from Ginger Assassin. It says, why do so Ginger many Assassin. people why do so many people badmouth sensors in the MBTI community? A lot of people badmouth sensors because, you know, when it comes to sensors, like SJs specifically, more so than SPs, have this uh, reputation of being like airheads or having heads in their sand, heads in the sand, basically, you know, because it's like, oh, well, you know, I've never heard of MBTI before and it's not culturally accepted. So why do I have to care about it? Why do I have to pay attention? Human beings have been getting by without knowing this information for so many years. Why is it relevant? Why do I care? Oh, it's still not relevant. Okay, it's not mainstream. I don't care anymore. And that's that's really what it comes down to. It's it's this called a, it's called sensor bias. Um, and the reason why is is that sensors make up seventy percent of the population of the planet, right? So there's this huge underlying bias that goes along with it that you just kind of you can't get away from. So, uh, Philip, that was hilarious. He just said that uh, SJs are NPCs, aka non-player characters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh nice uh, world of warcraft or everquest uh or albion online or whatever uh reference mmorpg reference um so but yeah awesome next question cool hibernator he says what does a typical entp woman look like not just physically what does she do etc to sum up what are the telltale signs of an entp woman and can you name some famous entp women um, yes, I can name it a famous ENTP woman. You can even read her book, Lou Andreas Salome. Um, uh, I did not spell her name right. Uh, but yes, uh, Lou Andreas Salome. Um, she wrote a book that teaches people about uh, how to be a coquette. Um, she also bedded Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, and uh, she has this uh, famous quote. <laughs> life's greatest ecstasy is the reception of semen i thought that was interesting <laughs> for, for a coquette uh entp wow but uh yeah she is definitely the most famous uh, entp woman uh out there um there is also um i i have had the opportunity to meet uh, a few entp women in my time um one who was like a supermodel um who uh uh, and then there's there's also another one who also did modeling, uh, and she's actually the daughter of uh, my mentor, uh, Mr. Robert Bryant, uh, my former uh, mentor, Mr. Robert Bryant, and uh, you know, and then she's an ENTP as well. Um, and uh, like, really, how to spot them? They just they just do whatever they want, you know. And sometimes they say one thing but do another. Basically, uh, they'll tell you some of their secrets to test whether or not you know they're true or not. But like, how do you spot them visually? They would usually wear all black, constantly wearing black. Uh, you know, makeup is not always a priority for them, uh, and that can be an issue. Uh, so just, you know, be aware of that as well. Um, and they're, they're, they can kind of be pretty practical. Uh, you can meet them at martial arts uh, places, anything to do with martial arts. Uh, ENCP women are very involved in that. And sometimes they can be insanely entrepreneurial or doing like so many different things that they're so focused on what they're doing that they don't really have time to like have relationships with other people as well. Uh, so that can, uh, you know, that could be a, a, a different approach uh, as well. So, but yeah, uh, next question. All right, that comes from Dedicata. It says, one ENTP said once that they can multitask, like driving while watching the stars. You also mentioned in your Q&A episode 8 that any hero is good at multitasking. But in the book Brain Rules, it says, people who appear to be good at multitasking actually have good working memories, capable of paying attention to several inputs at one time. Is this statement accurate? Is multitasking in anything or actually an SE working memory thing? As an INTJ, I'm bad at multitasking myself. Uh, it's, 
Okay, so you look at it this way. So you have um, so you have uh, introverted sensing, um, and then you have different paths moving forward from introverted sensing. Uh, and each of those paths is an NE uh, possibility, right? So it just kind of goes around like this uh, here on the whiteboard. NE, 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 all over the place, right? And uh, it's funny because I actually, so I was talking with, I was talking to a Lizard Wizard and Railgun simultaneously last night. I was having a conversation with both. At the same time, Lizard Wizard was on the phone and Railgun was um, was sitting across from me from uh, my dining table. And we were, we were having, I was literally having a conversation with both women simultaneously and I was, and they were both talking to me simultaneously. And I was paying attention to both people simultaneously uh, and able to keep up with both conversations simultaneously, right? And the reason why is, is because my any hero is aware of everything that they might say uh, given the experience that I'm having in the conversation, right, with either of them. So let's let's look at this. So Railgun's conversation could be coming through this vector here, whereas um, uh, Lizard Wizard's conversation could be coming in from this vector here. But I'm able to keep track of both simultaneously as it's hitting my SI because I'm experiencing both simultaneously through uh, expert intuition, what they might say. However, don't forget, uh, while it is what they might say, look at look at it this way. Check this out. Um, you know, I, I love these little visual uh, portrayals that we do. But then you have in black, extroverted sensing, and then extroverted sensing, right? So it's an SE shared experience in the moment that's being filtered through an extroverted intuition uh, possibility matrix that's shunting it as a vector right into my introverted sensing side of my you know a function, which is my long term memory. So it's SE getting to my SI through the filter of NE, and because I have high NE, I'm able to keep track of these vectors. Now, if I had SI hero, it'd be completely different. It'd be the other way around. The SEs would be on the, um, the SIs would be on the outside, the NE would be on the center, and it'd be a completely different approach. Uh, but that's basically how uh, you know expert intuition is able to multitask so much, because I could be driving, uh, you know, filming and eating at the same time. I remember one time I was on a phone meeting, I was driving, I was eating a Chipotle bowl with both my hands while driving with my phone on a WebEx conversation and it was a video call and I was eating and I was literally driving with my knees while while on, on the road, you know, going like at least 65 miles an hour on Interstate 80, right? So wow. I, I am very good at multitasking, you know, as a result of that. And so yeah, it is very any hero now. Why is NI Hero uh, not uh, not that way? Because NI Hero, NI is all about focus. And they really, I mean, this is why, because you could look at this like any heroes, they're farsighted. NI Heroes, NI Parents, they're usually nearsighted because they're so focused on this one area. It's like they have this frontal cone of visual spectrum of which they're looking at, et cetera. Whereas an expert intuition hero, they have 360 degree vision around them at all times, basically. It's just a shorter range, whereas that frontal cone of introverted intuition is just like very, very, very long range, et cetera. Uh, and that's how that works. Um, so, so yeah. I'm glad you, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, um, Chase, because frankly, I don't believe in multitasking. I don't think it's possible, but there again, I've got an eye hero. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So well, that's my experience. Yeah, yeah. So the NI users naturally will say that, you know, because they don't perceive the NE spectrum like I do, they would naturally say that multitasking is not really a thing. But when we see any heroes and any child, uh, like ESJs, they're very good at multitasking, actually. Any child is very good at multitasking, and no one gives them credit for it. And then their NI user SP counterparts are like, no, you're not multitasking. <laughs> when in reality the situation, uh, there is. Uh, so, you know, it, it just happens. But yeah, uh, so cool. Next question. Cool. Comes from Sir Ballin, and he says, what type is Freud? What type is Freud? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to uh, find out on a how to type lecture. What's next? He does have an alternate question. If you okay. Would answer that. Yes, I will. Okay. Why do you think Dr. Beebe was wrong about Young's type INTJ when he is clearly an INTP? 
Uh, see, I really like I really like uh, Doctor BB. Um, the thing is, though, is that he teaches people typing via um, via individual um, cognitive functions, and I I I do not subscribe to that methodology. And for some reason. Everybody out there, everybody out there that I talk to, there's people who message me all the time, like every day trying to debate me about whose type is who or this or that. And frankly, guys, like they, they always come up to me and they're like, well, you know, that behavior is not indicative of this function. And it's like, it's because you cannot accurately type somebody just by going on individual functions. You can't do it. It's impossible. The reason why, when you look at like uh, the beta quadra, right, which is STP NFJ quadra, right, STP NFJ quadra. Um, uh, when you look at that quadra, you know how introverted intuition behaviors manifest. They manifest in like four different ways. Oh, but wait, they actually manifest in eight different ways per type. How are you able to keep track of that, right? It's because you have to keep into consideration cognitive axis, you have to keep into consideration cognitive orbit, you have to keep in consideration synchronicity, you have to keep in uh, consideration emulation. So it's actually kind of almost impossible to, it's extremely difficult to tie people by individual functions, so like stop doing it. It's really annoying. Instead, people need to be typing each other using the type grid. Ooh, yes, the type grid is the dopest. and. Granted, I know that we have temperaments and interaction styles right now for the two vectors for using the type grid. We're about to release, there's a total of six vectors that you could use the type grid. There's cognitive axis, there's cognitive orbit, there's quadras, right? So many different ways, so many different ways uh, to utilize the type grid uh, to identify behaviors and to really eliminate it. Because remember, it's just like a multiplication table. You're just using deduction to eliminate, use the process of elimination to get to the type grid. And by following that elimination process, you have 100% accuracy with the type grid. But again, Dr. BB subscribes to the individual cognitive function typing uh, way of doing things. And because of that, and most people believe that's the most accurate way of doing it, it's not, it's absolutely not. And that's why we end up getting mistypes like saying Carl Jung is an INTJ instead of you know an INTP, for example. So, so yeah. Cool. Next question comes from Rage Act 19. It says, is narcolepsy or dyslexia more prominent in certain personality types? Ooh. <laughs> I wish I could say no, but that's not, uh, I, I, I actually, uh, actually cannot make that claim. So, uh, and, uh, but yes, uh, I, okay, so I have no actual data from which to make this claim. I just don't. But what I have noticed with narcolepsy, for some reason, uh, the majority of the narcoleptic people that I've met, and I've met a bunch, um, I used to work at a hospital. Um, so I got to know a lot of uh, interesting characters and I was able to tie people going in and out of that on a regular basis. But I noticed that SI child and SI inferior types, which are basically NPs, um, NPs, seem to be the ones most prone to getting narcolepsy. I don't know why. Uh, I even grew up with a few people who were narcoleptic and uh, uh, they were either INTPs or INFPs. It was, it was so odd to me uh, how that works. So all I'm saying, correlation is not causation, don't forget. There's just a correlation here that I've observed and there's not really much that I could do with it. And, and, and uh, Mello, what was the rest of the question? There's like a second part to it. Uh, the other half of that was dyslexia. Dyslexia, yes. Uh, dyslexia uh, seems to be mostly attached to SPs, um, for sure. Uh, SPs, uh, but specifically STPs. STPs seem to be the types that struggle with it the most, uh, followed by uh, potentially NFJs. And the reason why is low TE, um, more so than anything. But they, they're, they're so in the moment, right? Whereas the, whereas, um, written data is very uh, not in the moment, right? And it could be abstracted or it could be, uh, you know, because it's like stored in the a physical environment. So STP, NFJ, Quadra, I've seen it pretty high with, uh, you know, dyslexia, et cetera. 
Uh, but again, correlation is not causation. And I can't wait till we get to the point where we can actually perform some real studies and get some real data, which we will be able to uh, once uh, we get this company up off the ground and our software is deployed and available everywhere. So, All right. So next question comes from Kana. It says, what types do you think are the least and most jealous? What functions does this have to do with? All right, shout out to Kana. And uh, what um, the least or most jealous, is that what it is? Most or least or both? Uh, both. both are the least and most jealous. Okay, all right, Jay, I gotta ask, uh, what, what do you think? Who, who, who in your opinion <laughs> is the uh, jealous ones? <laughs> Uh, are you asking me from personal experience? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Personal experience. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, Chase, I'm. Uh, this is a tough one, but I would. Um, I want to say maybe ESFPs. Am I anywhere close on that one? ESFPs for jealousy. You know what? I I gotta say, you know. Yeah, I I have dealt with some serious ESFP jealousy, but you know, Railgun Railgun actually pointed out to me recently how an ENFJ uh, friend of mine, who's not really a very good friend, but like he would go out of his way to like not invite me to certain parties or certain certain shindigs specifically because he was he was jealous, right? And I was like, wow, you know, and she she really like expanded my horizons there because. She opened me up to like this whole, uh, you know, uh, SE, uh, you know, jealousy world and, and, and showing me like, hey, there's actually a lot of people, SE, out, SE users out there who are very jealous, you know, and, and I didn't even realize like, because because here's the thing. I'm systematic, right? I'm an ENTP and I mean, even Kana can can point this out, you know, because I'm so systematic, there's a lot of things that like I'm not even aware of, right? Um and, uh, you know, but however, when you look at interest based people now, it's completely different. And, you know, given that Railgun is, is interest based, she's also an SE user, uh, she's able to, you know, identify, you know, jealousy a lot quicker uh, in other people. And then she was able to point out to me, it's like, wow, 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 wow. Now, who, in my opinion, are the types that have the biggest problem with jealousy? Honestly, NJs. Uh, specifically SE Child and SE Inferiors, I think probably have the biggest struggle uh, with jealousy. I have seen jealousy in ESFPs, but the, when but when being the victim of jealousy, I've, I've been the victim of jealousy more so by NJs than any of the types. Uh, and that's just, it, it's just, uh, it's been consistent. And, and especially ever since Railgun uh, uh, pointed it out to me, I was like, okay, yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense um, because I'm like, hmm, well, and now like I've been going through my SI hard drive long-term memory and looking at all of my interactions with NJs in my life and like, okay, TI parent is assessing each individual one, were they jealous? And I, surprisingly enough, I've noticed that it is a consistent issue. Um, so, Well, you mentioned SE, what about FE in that, in that re respect? Well, I, perhaps now I have been the victim of uh, NFJ jealousy more so than NTJ jealousy. That's for sure. Because uh, I because I will I will admit that like the least jealousy that I've ever had to deal with is like ENTJs, because at least ENTJs are like they have this attitude of, well, I'm just going to study what you know anyway and be an expert like you. So I'm not worried about it. Like eventually I'll get there. Right. INTJs, they're more like, well. I'm still a better person than you are, and I don't have to uh, necessarily study this or compete with you because there's things that I know more about than you do. So I could be in my expert in my area, and you could be your expert in your area. At least the INTJ can come to that conclusion. Now the NFJs, however, that's not the case. It's like for example, like INFJs, even ENFJs, when they see me, especially using like the psychology to like help people, they get super jealous of me. And it's like, well, I should be the one who's helping those people, not you. And how come you know way more about how to help somebody than I do? And then they get jealous of me in that. And it's like as if I'm encroaching on their usefulness territory, right? And their FI critics and their FI uh, nemeses get in the way. And it's like, great, you know, thank you for straw manning me instead of like actually getting on the bandwagon and helping me, uh, you know, uh, help somebody. So, gosh, my nose is itching like crazy. Uh, so, yeah, 
but uh, I mean, what do you think, Jay? Is, is that is that what you feel you you have? Observed? Yeah, that, that's exactly that's exactly what I um, what I was thinking myself, and and I can certainly see it. So uh, good analysis, very good question. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, definitely, definitely a great question. One of the top two questions of the night for sure. What's next, Mister uh, Mello? All right, next is from Love. He says, "What should I do to prevent myself?" from going insane thinking about people and myself in terms of cognitive functions. I want to learn how to type and I love your content, but there's a part of me that feels I am losing not only my identity, but others as well. Um, that is Lev's INFP subconscious speaking. And I would like to tell everyone, Lev is a really dope dude. Uh, he's an ESTJ. He's a prominent member of the CSJ community. I, I really like the guy. I've had a few times, uh, to, I, I actually embarrassed him <laughs> at one point in time, and it was really hilarious, but he, he, he rolled with the punches. Uh, he, he took it like a man, and, and he kept moving forward anyway. You know, he's got, he's got some of that long-suffering, that ESTJ long-suffering in him, you know, some of that self-discipline. So that was pretty cool to watch. So, um, you know, I've got to give him some, some respect in that area uh, after I embarrassed him publicly. <laughs> so, so, yeah, Lev is definitely a cool dude in my book. Uh, but to answer his question, uh, it's just that honestly, all you got to do is just do more research and you got to test things like, see, uh, the problem is though, is that what he probably is dealing with is that the available research for this stuff, he's just gonna have to read a lot of books. But even then a lot of the research out there is just inaccurate about this anyway. So Lev bro, like just, just hang in there, be a little bit more patient, uh, and, you know, like, but, uh, but you also need to, uh, you know, take how you feel about these things and, and your beliefs about the science and take it to like a TI user and help them verify, help them verify you, help them verify what you believe about it. And then just really bring it to like a, an area of debate on a, on a, um, on a, uh, uh, on a regular basis, like debate them. Like, for example, I like Lev, uh, if you could talk to, um, some of the STPs, the NFJs of the server, um, like like talk to Kana, uh, you know about this stuff, and and, and debate Kana, for example. Uh, you know she's got TI child. Uh, she I'm sure she'd be happy to debate you about certain things and kind of verify your TE hero beliefs. That would be very useful. Um, and then and, and you know you could also uh, talk to some other people as well. But uh, but yeah, it, it really just comes down to like throw a bunch of information up on the wall and see what sticks. That's really the ESTJ way of doing it and try to find out, you know, what people think. Well, also, like, what are they wanting to achieve? And once you identify a way where you can morally, philosophically help another person to kind of guide their thinking in terms of the science, that's when you'll find your identity because your brain is literally telling you, hey, I need to be able to aspire with my INFP subconscious. I just don't know what kind of philosophy I can develop as a result of knowing the science so I can bring it to others. And that's literally all you're doing. But all you have to do, find those STPs and those NFJs um, in the CSJ community to be able to have those discussions with and you'll be able to get the information you're looking for. So. Well, and Chase, it's, it's really just one part of the, the equation. It's the nature side. There's the nurture side as well, which... True. Uh, Keeps us from. I mean, we're really not all in a box. We're we're very different, and a lot of that's because of the the nurture and how it how it interplays with our nature. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I I completely agree, and I know I haven't done a nurture series in a while, and I probably should, but. Uh, there's just so much content to cover from the psychology standpoint. Um, I am I am going to be working on a, nur a new nurture series soon, but I'm studying Ray Dalio right now, and uh, he's an ENTJ, and I want to make sure that I'm getting some of these points correctly before uh, bringing them to the floor with the next nurture uh, series. Uh, but yeah, it's it's definitely you know someone uh, someone is there. Um, uh, and uh, Osama G. Abu Lanin in the YouTube chat, how can you spot a person that his shadow is well developed and has the ego and the shadow are primary side of mind? How you can you tell which is the ego? Uh, use the uh, type grade to find out. Watch seasons 2 and 15 for the answer to those questions, as well as season 16. That would help you as well. But also uh, understand that the more mature a person is, the more developed their shadow is. So uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Mello, what's the next question? 
All right, so the next one comes from It's Been 1999, and he's included two images. I've sent you those over Discord. Okay, uh, did you send it to Lightfoot or? Yes. Okay, I'll look it on Lightfoot, standby. So, okay, cool. All right, so what's your opinion about this chart? Okay. I'll be... <laughs> Ah, those images are really cool. Um, you know what? I let's let's actually try to share those with the audience. Can you send those over to my Frankie Overwood account? Let's uh, let's see. If uh, they are there as well. All right, cool. Let me uh, let me bring it up here. Uh, awesome. And uh, I, let's see, open original. Uh, yep, cool. All right, uh, and. There we go. Awesome. Cool. So here's uh, here's one of the image, and it's uh, it's going through the tropes uh, with uh, the sixteen types. Uh, definitely something I plan on being lecturing on very soon. Uh, ISFJ is lawful good. You know what? I would agree with that. ESFJ as neutral good. Um, I would have put ISTJ as lawful evil, but I mean. Okay, uh, that's fair enough. ESTJ as, as lawful evil, ICJ as neutral evil. Hmm, yeah, maybe. And then uh, lawful neutral, um, you know, uh, evil, evil. So apparently ENTPs, oh yeah, chaotic evil, yes. Um, although, gosh, uh, I mean, their super egos are chaotic evil, but their ego is more uh, chaotic neutral, actually. The ENTP is gonna save your life one day and steal your car the following day, right? That's the ENTP way of doing it. So do I actually agree with this chart? I'm gonna have to say no. Uh, ultimately, there's a few flaws in this chart, um, and I think we're going to be uh, releasing like some of our own uh, in the near future. And there's another chart that you sent. What was the other one? Let's see. Okay. Let's see, good, neutral. Um, let's open the original for that one as well. Cool. And uh, gosh, I really like this image sharing that we're doing now. It's, it's so much nicer. <laughs> uh, do I agree with this chart? Um, neutral, chaotic, evil, INTJ, neutral, good, chaotic, good. No, I do not, I, I do not agree with this chart at all. I do not agree with it. Um, I don't. Uh, it's. Yeah, I mean, because here's the thing, guys, like you can't just put everyone in a box like this. You have to really take into account like subconscious, unconscious, super ego, because each of them have different behaviors. So reality, you know, it's not 16 types. It's really 16 times four is how many different combinations you have to look at of these in order to get these charts to more accurate. So this is way too limited. Um, so, uh, Okay, uh, uh, Courtney Bauer, uh, Courtney Bauerfeen, quick question. What advice could you give an INFJ looking for the purpose in terms of career? Uh, currently living in China, teaching English, but I'm struggling to find fulfillment. Uh, I recommend you watch the season 21 episode, How to Social Engineer an INFJ, uh, and also uh, watch the season 14, episode eight uh, lecture, which is uh, Patreon, for Patreon Gold members uh, to assist you with answers to those questions. But like INFJ careers, as long as you're just helping people and improving people and making them better, uh, you're basically, you'll find all the fulfillment that you're looking for, uh, for sure. So, but anyway, uh, next question, Mr. Mello. Comes from Meta. It says, is there ever any merit at all to mirroring, mirroring interaction style or should we always emulate the golden pair type? I ask because I've had a lot of success building a sense of commonality with my ISTJ boss as an INTP, mostly imitating movement focus and just avoiding abstract topics. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, definitely, definitely the best way to do it. Uh, there is nothing wrong with adjusting yourself uh, and adjusting your interaction uh, with, for the sake of the type. I highly, highly, highly recommend that. Okay, so this is, and, and, and Jay, this is where it gets into this debate where it's like, okay, is that a moral thing to do, right? Is that an ethical right. or moral thing to do? Because it's like, ah, oh, you're basically lying to them, you know, when you're, when we're doing like, you know, something like cognitive emulation, right? Or, um, 
Um, and, uh, and which, by the way, uh, Jay, if you could verify uh, in our little project that we have going on with uh, certain definitions, uh, can we verify yes. if cognitive emulation is actually in that list? If not, let's add it, add it to it. <laughs> uh, I believe it's in there. And uh, All right, cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. But, uh, but be that as it may, uh, you know, I get, every time I'm emulating, um, so here's another term, look at pretend. Uh, and then we're going to get into another discussion here. I'm so glad this question uh, was asked because I'm literally on the verge of going on a big rant. Uh, but before I do that, uh, Mr. J, I want to get your thoughts on this. What do, you, what do you think about cognitive emulation, whether or not it's moral or ethical? Oh, you're silent right now. I can't hear you. I think you muted yourself. Try that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. All good. Um, yeah. Um moral or ethical i mean i think we do it all the time we don't even realize it i mean i guess the moral or ethical depends on the motivation in doing it in the first place i mean are we doing it for some subversive purpose or uh, or are we doing it for um you know to help someone improve right um, that i think it i think it's the reason we do it not doing it itself yeah yeah, I no, I, I I completely agree with that. It's like, what is the purpose behind it? What is the what is the intention behind the emulation or or the pretense? Right? Is it is it a true pretense, or is it or is it false? You know, what what is the intention? Now, obviously, human beings are judged by our actions, and we're not judged by our intentions because remember, folks, good intentions are still still pave the road that leads to hell. Okay. The, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So remember, it's not all of those INFJs out there, uh, even though maybe even some INFPs, but all those INFJs out there who are just triggered by me saying that, that intentions don't really matter. No, they don't. Intentions don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things because it is your actions. The results of your actions are what you know, you're judged by. And that is the standard. That's the actual standard. So tell your FI critics to like get on that bandwagon because that's the actual standard, okay? But here's the thing. It goes even beyond that. You know, uh, let's let's look at this. Because anytime I've done cognitive emulation, and there was a certain, you know, there's an INTJ uh, recently uh, who really, really would just tell me how horrible of a person I was anytime I would do cognitive emulation or basically pretend, okay? And uh, I would adjust myself basically and it, would, and it would make me look like I was some insincere, you know, going into my, uh, my vice as an ENTP, an insincere ENTP and telling me that like, you know, I'm a bad person because I'm emulating or pretending for the, for the sake of another human being because they're like, it's dishonest. They have the standard, this TE parent standard of that's dishonest. No, you know, you can't do that. You're a bad person for doing that. But here's the thing, you know, like, and, and, and they're basically saying you're only being, uh, you're pretending, you're actually lying to them. You are a liar. So I was labeled a liar for doing this. And what I was doing is I was actually helping somebody. I wasn't social engineering them in a negative way, trying to get like something out of them. I was, I was social engineering them in a good way, trying to show them and teach this person something that they didn't think about before and expose a flaw that they had within their soul, you know, their inferior function, so that they could actually aspire and become a better person. And in order for them to listen to me, I had to appeal to their critic function to get them to listen to me because that's where a person's wisdom exists. That's how you instruct fellow human beings is by instructing their critic function. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. A lot of people aren't really willing to listen. I had to do cognitive emulation and basically pretend uh, I was pretending in order to get them to listen to me because they were not compatible with me. They were not compatible with me at all. Why? Because they were an INTP, this person I was trying to reach. No compatibility. It's like super high camaraderie, but no compatibility. And I was labeled a liar for doing this. You know, and it, but the thing is, is that the purpose was that I was trying to get this INTP to get out of their comfort zone. You know, I had unleashed my SE demon on them eventually, and uh, and then and then ha I ended up having to guilt them in in order to take action. But they did take action. Well, here's the issue. You know, uh, by which standard are human beings labeling each other liars? By which standard, right? Like, what what is a liar? Like, could someone please define that for me? Because, like, here's the situation. If you're going to actually look at something biblical, because uh, you know how I enjoy going to biblical uh, teachings, 
Uh, in the Ten Commandments, you know, the Ten Commandments is often regarded by the modern church, we'll say, as, you know, the standard definition as to what sin is, okay? So people think like sin equals breaking the Ten Commandments, okay? And if that's the case, right, sin equals breaking the Ten Commandments, at least, you know, that's maybe how it was in the Old Testament, etc. But let me, let me ask the, this audience a question, okay? Where in the Ten Commandments does it say, thou shalt not lie? Someone please answer that question, because you can't. You can't answer that question. It does not say, thou shalt not lie. Actually, what it says is, thou shalt not bear witness against your neighbor. Basically, telling false things about somebody else to get them in trouble. That's what it says. It does not say, thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not pretend. Thou shalt not cognitive emulate. You see what I'm saying? So there's a completely different moral standard than most people, especially those Christians and Muslims out there who have this standard, who have this idea, because I'm sorry, folks, like, I mean, uh, Islam is still technically based on the Bible. I mean, even the Prophet Muhammad even said as much, et cetera. And the early, uh, the early uh, Islamic movement still, still regarded many books of the Bible as canon for their own, uh, for their own uh, sacred scriptures, et cetera. So the point is, like, because they still take the Ten Commandments very seriously. Uh, and, you know, okay, but so where does it say thou shalt not lie? Okay. Now, uh, to, to really understand it, you want to look at the teachings of Jesus to really get the true standard of, of lying, etc. And look at what he says, because he didn't lie to anybody. Uh, but but, he, but you, you really have to understand, like, from an ethical, moral point of view, like, what is the result of your action? Okay. Now, I'm not telling everyone to go out there and be liars. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that you really have no right to hold other people accountable for cognitive emulating uh, for your or other people's benefit. You really don't, okay? Ow, but they're just being insincere. No, actually they're being loving, okay? How about you give them props for that? How about you give them recognition for that? How about you give them credit for that? That would be nice, but apparently they don't, you know? So anyway, that's just kind of, that's kind of my two cents. Uh, actually, that's my 50 cents on that. <laughs> well, and I agree. I mean, if you think about it, sometimes, I mean, what do we do just to get along with people that, you know, that we wouldn't normally get along with? We, we emulate. We, we lie, in a way, for the sake of getting along. And how is that a bad thing? You know, I guess that's where I come from. Yeah, one, one could say it's unethical if you have this power to, to improve communication and you don't use it. One, one could even make that argument. That's a good point. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Well said. Well said, Mello, because like, you know, as <laughs> as uh, uh, as Uncle Ben would tell Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. You are responsible with what you know. You are responsible because it is written in the book of James, whether it's chapter four, chapter five. If any man knows what good he ought to do, but does not do it, he sins. And what if the good that he ought to do is cognitive emulation? What if the good he ought to do is pretending? Has anyone even thought about that? How about that, FI child? Explain to me where your morals are on that point. Oh, wait, you can't. So, next, next question. Hey, we've got a super chat, Chase. Oh, awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> Let me pull it up here real quick. Um, hang on one second. Um, from Kevin Chun. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, is programming okay for ESFPs? Okay, so programming for ESFPs. I have noticed ESFPs being uh, INTJ, subconscious focus, being successful in programming. The thing is, though, is that do they have the uh, self-discipline to really see through completing the programs? It's really from a from a. Would I recommend? Would I act? Would I personally recommend an ESFP getting into computer programming? I probably wouldn't. Unless they were chaining together pre-existing scripts that already exist instead of creating something you know, on their own, I wouldn't recommend it. Honestly, really leave computer programming to the TI users. And the best computer programmers, and I know a lot of people get on me for saying this, but the best, uh, the best computer programmers out there are STP plus NFJ Quadra, like hands down. I, I, I've seen some insanely good ENFJ p computer programmers out there. It's unbelievable uh, that are just, they just blow it out of the water. I, I've known some insanely good INFJ ones as well. I knew an ESTP computer programmer, I just couldn't believe. But STP NFJ Quadra is amazing at computer programming. 
That's not to say that an ENTP or an INTP uh, could pull it off because they absolutely can pull it off, especially the INTP. But STP NFJ Quadra uh, definitely uh, can, can move forward on that for sure. So uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, would I personally recommend an ESFP get into computer programming? I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, not something I recommend. And if you guys can see, like, uh, we got uh, CS Joker up there in the corner, and uh, he's telling everyone, you know, not something I'd recommend uh, for sure on that. Um, so, so yeah, uh, just something to be aware of. Now, that's not to say that they can't do it, but you're just going to end up stressing yourself out, losing a bunch of energy, and trying to figure out something else to do. And then you'll be in school for, like, seven different schools with, like, 40 different majors and still have no idea what you're trying to go for, at least from a secondary education standpoint. So, again... Not something I'd recommend. Doable, but probably not not ideal. So, and Chase, we're we're we've been going about an hour. Do you want to switch back to some platinum and Patreon questions for a minute? Uh, sure, uh, Mr. Mello. Uh, have we? Uh, are we still on the Patreon questions? Yes, we are still oh, going through right. the first round. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Wow, that's really Looks good. Like there, are, there are three left. Okay, my fault. It's all no worries. Good. We've been spending a lot of time because some of these questions have been really dope. Yep. So Hashtag that's the next question. The cool. It comes from Christian. He says, do you think that types are naturally attracted to people in the quadra most compatible with yours? For example, alpha to gamma, delta to beta, or is it more dependent on nurtural things, which could be related to like, Attachment styles as to whether you decide to get into a relationship with someone of the most compatible or your own quadra. For example, someone with an anxious attachment style or fearful avoidant getting into a relationship with your own quadra instead of the compatible one which someone of the secure attachment style might do theoretically. That is a great question. Who asked that question? Christian. Christian, the man. I, 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 shout out to Christian. That guy, that guy is the yeetest. Uh, definitely uh, one of my favorite people on the server. Uh, Christian, uh, thank you for such an amazing question. Okay, so let's break it down. Uh, nature. It's all about uh, nature. Nature always trumps nurture because guess what? Nature is primary. So we're going to put a P here and we're going to put secondary for nurture. Nature is always primary. So yes, you are more likely to be attracted to uh, your, the, uh, the quadra um, that is uh, uh, you know, more compatible with your nature. So SFP, NTJ quadra you would be with like SFJ, NTP quadra, etc. However, nurture can take uh, can get in there and then can make some changes. Like there's some people who have had professions like, um, like for example, someone who was like an escort, right? A woman who was an escort and then it changes her, um, her love languages basically, because, uh, let's say she's like an INFJ and, uh, you know, INFJs typically are super high physical touch, but given that she's an escort or was an escort for so many years, physical touch doesn't mean as much to her anymore, etc. And other love languages have developed. So that's very nurtural, right? And, uh, and attachment styles definitely do come into play, uh, for sure. Uh, now matching attachment styles, they, they, they change all the time because as a person change, uh, had, like grows basically in their life and they experience more in their life, uh, there are some, uh, there's some different adjustments in that area because it's like, okay, I'm growing, my nurture is changing on the fly. So things can, things that weren't really something that would happen before with your nature are happening now. A great example of this would be the relationship that my aunt and uncle have. My, my aunt is an ENFJ. My, uh, my uncle is an, an INFJ. The two NFJs in a relationship, they've been married for like almost 40 years. It's just absolutely, you know, unbelievable what they've been able to pull off. Super high camaraderie, very low compatibility, but they love each other very much. And they're, they're nurturers. They have similar uh, nurturers and similar backgrounds, etc. And, uh, you know, having that opportunity is, is something that's, uh, you know, pretty unbelievable. Um, you know, so, uh, so anyway, um, so cool. Uh, we'll get that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's basically how I'd answer that question um, for sure on that one. Cool. The next question comes from Parzival, and it says, "Hey Chase, 
Do you have a plan to eventually make a series on each type and their perfect form would be? Like what each type should aspire to be and general advice for each type for their growth. I'm all for judging each type by their own standards, not my own. And uh, then he has, he has in parentheses also PS, would be neat if verified golden pairs of each type also had input for deciding what's the best version of the type outside of a, an ENTP standpoint or worse yet, types deciding what's the, what the best version of their own types. Blind spots. LOL. So he's looking for like a, a video series on uh, how, how each type can improve and, and for their subconscious development and then how to avoid the pitfalls. Uh, is that basically what I'm hearing? Yes. Yeah. The answer to that question so. is yes. And uh, that is something that was going to be released on, on Patreon at a later date. But I actually might put that as, as a YouTube public, actually. Um, so just something that uh, would probably end up happening. Very cool. The next question comes from Valentina Belovsky. Hope I said that correctly. It says, okay. I've heard the subconscious described as the part of the brain that contains repressed long-term memories and also the part of the brain that performs tasks that we don't consciously think about. For someone who doesn't have SI in their subconscious, this doesn't seem to add up. How do these traits of the subconscious fit into the system of typology? Also, do you agree that these are traits of the subconscious mind? If not, why? Uh, great question, but... Um... Um, uh, so, uh, like, can you, can you translate that for me, uh, just a little bit, like simplify that question for me? Sure. You'll give me a moment. So they're saying that they've heard the subconscious described as the place that holds repressed long-term memories and also part of the brain that performs tasks oh, okay. yeah, yeah, not yeah. consciously thought about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so, so okay. Uh, Valentina, please review Dario Nardi's work. Uh, he wrote the book, The Neuroscience of Personality. I highly recommend that book. While I disagree with him fundamentally about where he got his data input, uh, his methodology is, is, is very similar. Uh, what the scientific community defines as the subconscious uh, within which area of the brain that sub subconscious exists, I actually fundamentally disagree with. I absolutely fundamentally disagree with the scientific community on that because the way that they're presenting the subconscious is, is not how it's actually defined. Uh, it's, and I'm not even going to go so far as to like do that, you know, the, uh, the, the NFJ counselor cop out and say, oh, it's more metaphysical, you know, don't, don't do it that way. No, I'm not doing that. There is an actual way you could attach it to the brain, but we have to really expand Dario Nardi's work more so before we can actually know that. Uh, I would love to recreate a redo all of Dario Nardi's experiments again, but with each person that participates in the experiment, knowing for a fact what their type is and verifying it, because I believe his data and his results are very skewed as a result. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, just just something uh, to to be aware of uh, for sure. But again, uh, please review uh, please review uh, Dario Nardi's work for sure. Cool, and that's it for the Patreon questions. Awesome. Uh, well, let's get right into some Discord questions for sure. Uh, okay, cool. So, find my place here. So it comes from the Uncanny Aaron. It says, how do you set up a Xanatos Gambit in real life? For instance, is using your Tinder account for the sole purpose of practicing social engineering an example of a Xanatos Gambit? Uh, no, uh, using a Tinder account is not an example of using a Xanatos Gambit. And if I was going to do it, if I was going to tell you a place that you could actually like practice uh, social engineering, the best game out there to practice social engineering, hands down, is EVE Online. Hands down, the best. Uh, specifically, if you start playing the game with the purpose of becoming a spy, uh, they're the absolute most important. Uh, it's, the, it's the best MMORPG out there is EVE Online to be able to practice uh, social engineering uh, and typing and whatnot uh, it's, and, and perform an actual Xanatos Gambit. Uh, 
So I, I did uh, perform a Xanatos. Um, um, oh, Superboy asks, will you donate any money to a homeless person? It depends if they're actually disabled or not. Uh, and if they are dos disabled, I probably would give them food and help them in a program area. Otherwise, I'd probably tell said homeless person, no, go get a job. You're able-bodied. McDonald's is hiring down the street, um, just like you know the rest of us who have jobs and produce. Uh, so... Um, Anyway, uh, to set up a Xanatos Gambit, um, a Xanatos, um, basically it really comes down to, you have to understand like, what is your goal? You know, what, what, are, you, what are you trying to achieve uh, with your Xanatos Gambit? And then, um, and then you, you go to like an, an NI user and you just provide them with choices. And you just make sure that all of those choices benefit uh, the goal. That's really all it is. And then just make sure that the choices are long, stringed out, and then, and then so that whatever choice that they determine will uh, ultimately achieve your goal at the end. If, they take, if you make some mistakes, we'll just provide additional choices. Keep providing choices until they've led down a, until they're led down a path for them to reach your goal. Uh, uh, just so, and and you can also do something called shock testing. It's not something we've talked about. Um, shock testing is a very interesting uh, term. It was originally coined Looks by. Like it. There you are. There you are. Say again. We lost you there for a minute. Oh, okay. Sorry. I uh, uh, glad to uh, be back. I had some drop frames there for a little bit. Uh, cool. Glad to uh, be back. Uh, so. Back with the Xanatos Gambit, again, it's all about, you know, you have your stated goal, uh, you provide them choices, and then you give them, uh, and then you give them a goal uh, from there. Um, but uh, you can actually test if your Xanatos Gambit is working with a methodology known as shock testing. And shock testing comes from a man by the name of William Cooper. William Cooper uh, coined the phrase shock testing. Uh, and you can also combine that with this concept known as the Overton window, the Overton window. And I think there was like a, a book that was marketed by Glenn Beck at one point in time about the uh, Overton window and uh, the Overton window uh, and combining with shock testing, according to William Cooper, you can actually test, uh, you can actually test your Xanatos Gambit. Uh, just be aware though, like your target could use something called a canary trap. And if you if you get uh, canary trapped, uh, that could be a serious issue when you're performing a Xanatos Gambit on someone. So you always got to watch out for the canary trap. Also watch out for red herrings um, as well. Study each of these concepts. Uh, so uh, because the canary trap and the red herring is how somebody can get out of a Xanatos Gambit. That's how you get out of it. It's kind of like when you do a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and like there's you know and you have a reverse naked choke. How are you going to get out of it? Well, you have to be aware of the canary trap and the red herring when you're performing Xanatos Gambit because that's how an NI user can actually get out of a Xanatos Gambit is by performing those two social engineering tactics. But you can do shock testing according to William Cooper, um, and also uh, you understand the Overton window because you use the Overton window concept to actually design the choices that you're providing your target when you're performing a Xanatos Gambit. Uh, and the best place to test this is the video game Eve Online, uh, hands down. Though, um, but yeah. And Chase, we've got a uh, super chat from J.K., but okay. uh, no, no question attached, uh, just um, a contribution. So J.K., if you'd like to ask a question, we'd be happy to answer it. Yep. We'll see if he uh, answers the question. So, Coolio. All right, for the time being, Lost Trails chimes in with, do certain types do better in day trading? Would an INFJ and the ENFP side of their mind do well? What if an INFJ learned how to trade from watching a master? Thank you. They could pull it off. An INFJ could pull off day trading and, and be pretty good at it, but eventually they'll just burn out. Um, they, will, they will inevitably burn out. There's not much that can be done with it. They just don't have the self-discipline for it uh, in the long run. Uh, with all the willpower that can muster, it's just not going to happen. Uh, honestly, the best uh, day traders out there, hands down, are STJ, NFP Quadra, with the INFP being the absolute best day trader out there. No one can out day trade an INFP. They are bloody brilliant at it. 
Uh, I've known a few INTPs uh, who attempt at it, but in the end, uh, while they try to systematize everything, it can be an issue. Some ENTJs are good at it, but really STJ NFP Quadra is the best with INFP being the absolute best day trader, uh, hands down. Uh, so get an INFP on your team basically, and uh, it can be like a day trade management, uh, which can go really well. Uh, you know, take take it from like Ray Dalio's point of view with how he approaches uh, financial management. Uh, Ray Dalio, he is an ENTJ, but he has like INFP assistants uh, working with him on a regular basis uh, to ensure that they're uh, doing the right thing, etc. So yeah. Hey, Keanu Reeves, you're breathtaking at uh, day trading. LOL. Yep. Hmm. All right. So. Heather says, hi, Chase. This is my first time commenting or asking.